Chapter 21 Dinner with the Devil What was going on? What horror! The stricken faces on the others testified that this was really happening. Navarra's knees began to buckle, but somehow she managed to walk behind Rowan as Rahadin beckoned them onward. He led them up a spiral staircase, different from the one he had recently descended. A chill wind blew through the stairwell, killing the heat from the torches. All the sights, sounds, and smells passed Navarra in a blur as she racked her mind to understand what had just happened. A flurry of questions rattled in her thoughts as they wound up the passageway to the fourth floor. Rahadin led them into a lounge, a well-furnished room with plush chairs and an impressive bookcase. Rain pattered on the three bay windows that adorned the rounded wall opposite the door. Through the storm outside, she could make out the rooftop of the keep below the windows. Clearly they were in one of the castle's towers. As soon as Navarra entered, she could not stop herself from asking, But where's the real Vasily? There has only ever been one Vasily, Rahadin said, whose sharp face looked at her with steely condescension. I don't know why my lord does it, disguising himself as a human gentleman. I think it amuses him to see how people reveal their true folly when they think themselves in the presence of a fool. So you see... Vasily von Holtz is, and always has been, Count Strad. Navarra let out a moan. Every soft word, every touch, every kiss had been shared with the vampire. And what about her mission, her friend's secrets, the prophecy? How much had she told Vasily? What had he seen? What did he know? Now, Rahadin said, turning to the two figures who had just walked in from a door on the other side of the room. One of them was a vampire they had seen before. The other was a young woman who looked to be human. Escher and Gertrude will help you dress. When you are ready, they will bring you to the Great Hall. Rahadin left them, and Escher came forward. My master has formal wear for each of you the vampire said as he showed them into a bedroom adjacent to the lounge. Lying on a large four-poster bed were three evening gowns of different colors and a violet three-piece suit. Gertrude matched each dress with its intended wearer, while Escher gave Henry the suit. The purple outfit's bright hue and lacy cravat echoed the foppish style of Escher's own attire. Thank you, Henry said when Escher began helping him undress. But we can dress ourselves. Could you give us a moment? Very well, Escher said. We'll be waiting in the portrait gallery outside the lounge when you're ready. The vampire and the woman walked out, closing the doors behind them. Henry threw the suit back on the bed and ran his hands through his hair. Navarra, you were with him all the time. How could you not know? Navarra scrunched up her face. Me? she said in a hurt tone. Who was it that wanted to make him the burgomaster of Valaki? Hm, Henry? Then she turned on Rowan. And why did you trust him? You, who never trust anyone, trusted Vasily as soon as we met him. I thought you were good at judging people's character. Don't accuse me. Rowan said, holding her hands up. I didn't flirt with a random stranger at the pub. Then the druid glared at Henry. I'm also not the one who claims his magic can feel the presence of undeath. Henry, you said you cast divine sense at the Blue Water Inn when Vasily was right there. Let's stop arguing about whose fault it is, Irina said. We were all fooled, every one of us. The only person we should blame is Strahd. He is a wizard, after all, and I'm sure he has more magic up his sleeve than just changing his appearance. He must have layered spells on himself to alter and disguise his body. Navarra pulled her hair. She should have known better. She herself could cast such spells, 
and should have recognized the signs. But how could the vampire hide from Henry's magic? Then it dawned on her. Nistul's magic aura, she said, putting a hand on her forehead. It's the same spell Victor used on the skeleton cats to mask their undead nature. Strahd must have been using it when Henry cast his divine sense. Navara, Rowan said, I have to ask, did you not notice that his skin was cold to the touch? Or did he change that too? Navara thought. He could have used prestidigitation. What does that do? Irina asked. Navara wrapped her arms around herself. It's a simple cantrip, a magic trick that novice spellcasters use for practice. It can create small sensory effects, like setting off sparks, musical notes, or something like that. My mother would use it for cleaning the house. But it can also change the temperature of non-living material, like a vampire's flesh. Vasily always felt like a living body should. He really had it all planned, Rowan said, looking down at the faded carpet. What about how much he knows? Henry asked. His brow turned up in dismay. I'm just glad we didn't tell him about... Rowan pressed her hand over Navara's mouth. He could still be listening, the druid said. Navara was thinking about Apollo, but then she remembered something else. The tome. They had buried it right in front of Vasili. That book was a part of the prophecy. If they lost it, what would that mean? The others must have been thinking the same thing, because Henry asked, Is there a way we could get the book back? I doubt it, Rowan said. What about the Mardikovs, the keepers of the feather? Navara didn't think she had told Vasily the family's secret, although Davian had said Strahd might already know and simply didn't consider them a threat. Regardless, she needed to keep her mouth shut. She had blabbed to Vasily about a number of things. Thankfully, she had not told him about Madame Eva's card reading. At the time, she thought it would go over his head, so she hadn't bothered. But what about installing him as the burgomaster of Vallaki? Henry wasn't the only one to blame. She, Rowan, and Irina had all played a role in the coup. So much for their political revolution. So much for their smug reassurance that justice had been done. Strahd probably had a grand laugh when they put him in charge of his own domain. We should get changed and go, Henry said. The women dressed in the bedroom while Henry donned his suit in the lounge. Navara put on the red dress, slim fitting with elegant sleeves that fell off the shoulder. Rowan wore the golden gown that ran to the floor with long satin folds. For Irina, there was a white gown, richly adorned with lace and with an open back that exposed her thin figure. It looked suspiciously like a wedding dress, and Irina was not happy about it. All the clothes fit perfectly, as if the garments had been measured for their wearers by a tailor. Though all four friends cut a dashing picture in their elegant finery, none of them had ever felt so dejected and out of place as they did in that room. Too afraid to discuss anything further, and too humiliated to linger, they set out for the great hall. Escher and Gertruda led them back downstairs, showing off a regal painting of Strahd in the corridor along the way. Even his portrait seemed to be jeering at them. Gertruda? Irina asked. The young woman turned to look at her. Gertruda's blue eyes were large and pouty. Her plump lips turned with a disdainful frown. Yes, she asked curtly. You're Mad Mary's daughter, Irina said. I know your mother. Right before I left the village of Barovia, she wanted Ismark to help find you. Are you a prisoner here? Gertruda gave a fake laugh. Ha! Huh. No, I came here all on my own. My mother kept me shut away, trying to scare me with stories about Strahd, as though he were some kind of boogeyman. I came here to find the truth, and of course he took a liking to me right away. I'm his mistress now. Irina was shocked into silence. 
Don't be so surprised, Gertrude said, as they walked down the spiral stair. Just because you're his favorite now doesn't mean you will be forever. Don't mind her, Lady Irina, Escher said, speaking with an accent foreign to Barovia. She's still learning her place. What's that supposed to mean? Gertruda asked. But all conversation was put on hold as they passed through an arched hallway, and they were greeted by the overwhelming sound of a pipe organ. The music became even louder when Escher opened a set of double doors, the notes flowing around them like eddies in a stream as they entered the great hall. The bellowing of the pipes echoed off the stone walls, reverberating into the floor and up Navarra's chest. Seated at the organ, with his back toward them, was a man hunched over the keys, swaying to the harsh melody with rapt abandon. After playing the final chord, he turned around and greeted them. It was Strahd, now wearing a jeweled doublet that befit his noble station. Friends, he said, I am so glad you have come. Please take your seats. He stood up from his bench and gestured for them to take their place at the long dining table. Escher went to the left-hand side, where Strahd's other consorts were already waiting. Valenta stood behind one chair, her face hidden as usual behind a skull mask. Behind another chair stood Anastrasia, Davian's mother, Navarra thought. Frozen in time by the curse of undeath, she now looked much younger than her son. The four friends shuffled to the right side, opposite the consorts, passing Rahadin, who stood at the end of the table near the double doors. They pressed into one another, like a flock of frightened sheep, Navarra thought. None of them wanted to sit next to Strahd. Irina took the far chair, sitting down beside Rahadin. The chamberlain cleared his throat. Ahem! <clears throat> Not before the host, he hissed. Irina stood up quickly. Strahd smirked and leisurely sat down at the head of the table. At once the consorts and Rahadin pulled out their chairs, scraping wood against stone, and sat down. The four friends hesitated before slowly following suit. Rahadin cleared his throat again. Ahem! <clears throat> Your seat is by the master, he said to Irina. Making no complaint, Irina sat beside Strahd. Navara came next, wanting desperately to give Irina some word of encouragement, but without any courageous words coming to mind. Instead, the warlock quietly took her place on Irina's left, pressing her thumbs together in her lap and staring at the silverware. Rowan sat by Navara leaving Henry to sit by Rahadin. Gertruda and another servant came out with the first course. Brie and pear finger sandwiches, oysters on the half-shell, and prosciutto-stuffed mushrooms. Navarra watched as Gertruda poured an aromatic vermouth into her goblet. "'My friends,' Strahd said, "'your exploits are quickly becoming the talk of the valley. "'You survived the werewolves on the road.' You slew a coven of hags at the old mill. You saved my beloved Irina from her deranged brother. For that I must thank you. You defeated a nest of vampires in Velaki, even killing one of my own consorts, Ludmila Vilasevic. You rescued my friend Luvash's daughter from a mad fisherman. You broke into the abbey of St. Markovia and murdered the abbot. Need I mention your antics in Berez? And somewhere along the way you even discovered my old journal. After seeing all these things, I must ask, Why have you come to Barovia? And what more do you intend to do in my fair county? The three vampires sitting across from them sipped a dark red liquid from their wine goblets. But if Navarra had to bet, it was not wine. Navarra had lost her appetite. She stared at her plate, upset that she wouldn't be able to enjoy the meal. Beside her, Henry was shoveling food into his mouth and washing it down with drink. His easy manner made it seem like he dined here often. 
You were all more talkative in the carriage on the way here, Strahd said, breaking the long pause. Come, tell me. You already know why I'm here, Navara said, eyes still fixed on her plate, a range of emotions swelling inside her. Yes, he said. You think that by confronting Mother Knight you will somehow break the curse that holds Barovia in the Shadowfell. And the rest of you are just along for the ride, I take it. Henry took another bite of food, determined to stay calm. But every time he lifted his fork to his mouth his hand trembled. Our lives are an open book, it seems, he said, swishing the vermouth in his glass. Our exploits have only been for the good of the valley. He forked some more mushrooms into his mouth, fearing to say more. The sound of cutlery on plates echoed through the hall. Henry cleaned his dish with one last bite, and, just as he could bear the silence no longer, Gertruda and the other maid brought out the second course, lobster bisque served with fresh bread, caviar, and a glass of sherry. This decadence was clearly beyond what the valley could produce. Vistani travelers must have brought these delicacies from beyond the mist. The vampires continued sipping their glasses after they were refilled with the same red beverage. Strahd sat with folded hands, watching them all, no food or drink to keep him occupied. I have invited you to my house so that we might become better acquainted. I am dying to learn more about you, but I understand you might first have questions about me. So, ask away. What do you want to know about Strahd von Zarevich? Still none of them spoke. Come, you all must have questions. Novara cleared her throat. When did you last write in your journal? Strahd's eyes narrowed. Yes, it still baffles me to think how my personal diary could have found its way into your hands. You were even able to decipher one of my spells. Very impressive, Navara. I dread to think what private details of my life you may have read and misinterpreted. If the term had been in your hands for too much longer, you could have unmasked all my secrets, even the identity of a certain... Vasily von Holtz, he smiled. Rest assured, you will not be seeing that book again. Strahd hadn't actually answered Navara's question, but no one bothered to point it out. When the third course was placed on the table, Henry didn't notice anything unusual about the food at first. But as he took his first bite, he thought of home. He looked down at the plate, smoked salmon with cream cheese and capers, and lamb chops with lingonberry compote. The salmon melted in his mouth with a hint of chili pepper, exactly the way Henry's father would make it. Henry swallowed. Although the food was a perfect rendering of his favorite meal, he felt ill. How did the vampire know? Was his father all right? Was his mother? His parents should be safe in Blackford, weren't they? He washed the food down with a sip of champagne, the third drink of the evening. Henry of Blackford, Strahd said, turning to him. You are an enigma to me. You can sprout wings from your back. Now a rumor has begun to circulate that you are the white angel of prophecy, come to bring light to the valley. But I know that you are not the white angel. In fact, you killed him. You bear a facsimile of my brother's sword. Then his eyes narrowed, and his voice became quiet. You even look a little like Sergei. But he is dead, so the question remains, who are you? Henry couldn't eat another bite. Just Henry Gibson, plain and simple. Went to school at the houses of Merlin, trained in the army, came back home, I like fishing. Without food stopping his mouth, Henry began to ramble, not caring where his sentences started or where they ended, as long as they did not touch on Barovia or the Sun Sword. He was starting on another tangent about fly fishing when Strahd cut him off. 
Quite interesting, Henry, the vampire said with mock fascination. I am sure I would love to hear more if I ever have trouble sleeping. But I think you are boring the ladies. And there is so much yet to discuss. Now, Rowan, let us hear more about you. Plates were cleared again, and the fourth course arrived. Romaine salad with shallots, candied pecans, and strawberries, served with a cream vinaigrette. Rowan, who had not touched a single crumb of food since sitting down, stared at the plate in shock. It was a meal Rowan's mother used to make. Hands that had been held firmly at her sides began to twitch. I did not know who you really were when I first brought you into Barovia, Strahd said, nor when you turned into a wolf and so bravely tried to kill me. As I have been watching you these past weeks, however, the thought has occurred to me that I might know more about you than you know about yourself. But please, do not let that dissuade you. Tell me, who is Rowan von Zarevich? Rowan felt like she had been punched in the stomach. You look surprised, Strahd said. Did your father never tell you his family name? Rowan bit her tongue, holding back. Then, in a reserved tone, she said, Since you clearly hold all the cards, why don't you tell me? Very well, Strahd said. Rahadin, please enlighten everyone with the story of Barovia's beginnings. Rahadin laid down his fork and dabbed his mouth with a napkin. In ancient times, he said, the valley was home to the Dusk Elves. Prince Talath, Lord of the Elves, was a weak and corrupt man. He allowed himself and his people to be dominated by a powerful silver dragon named Arginvost and his company of knights. But I and my brother Metus spoke out against the dragon. He addressed only Rowan when he said this, his stern features never flinching. We defied Prince Talath to his face, and because of our boldness we were banished. So... Metus and I fled to the court of the Gallogrodian king, Barov, and his queen, Ravanovia. They received us with great hospitality, even adopting us into the royal family alongside their own sons, Strad and Sergei. Metus and I told King Barov about the evil magic that Arginvost and his knights were hoarding in the mountains. We told him about the weakness of the elven prince and how his people groveled in subservience to the dragon. King Barov resolved to right these wrongs, so he took his army and invaded the valley. But Argenvost and the Dusk Elves were not easily subdued. We fought them for ten years with much bloodshed on both sides. A fierce counterattack repulsed the Gallogrodians from the gates of Kresik, even striking down King Barov himself and grievously injuring his son Strad. Prince Strad found a refuge among the Vistani, who sheltered him until he had recovered from his wounds. The fortunes of war changed, however, when Strad took command of his father's army. He was brave cunning and skilled in the art of war. In a brilliant campaign, he outmaneuvered and outfought his enemies at every turn. He trapped the elven army in an ambush and cut them down to the last man. Prince Talath and his entire household fell that day. Then Strad laid siege to the fortress of Arginvostolt and brought fire to the towns and villages. My brother and I hunted down the elves, obliterating the royal line and crushing all hope of resistance. Finally, with most of his knights already dead or starving, Argenvost himself sallied forth in a desperate attempt to kill the Gallogrodian prince. But Strad slew the dragon with his own sword. 
Those who remained of the Dusk Elves were enslaved to the Vistani as punishment for their defiance. But those who had served Strad faithfully were rewarded with gold, lands, and titles. He renamed the valley after his father and brought human settlers to repopulate the devastated countryside. He commanded the best wizards and artisans of Galograd to erect a mighty castle in the heart of the new county. In honor of his mother, he called it Ravenloft. And here we are. Strahd applauded. Wonderful retelling, Rahadin. So, Rahadin was Rowan's uncle by blood, and Strahd claimed to be her uncle by adoption. What happened to my father? Rowan asked. The story of Baron Mattis had always been a mystery to her. She had only ever wanted to know why he killed her mother, never caring before about where he came from. But now she wanted to know, needed to know all. Mattis was more than a brother. He was my best friend. Strahd's mood changed. There was no trace of mockery or haughtiness. I gave him everything, even made him my equal, a full vampire. But he threw it all away. He wanted more power and would do anything to get it. Now Strahd's voice turned bitter. Metis tried to overthrow me, tried to take my place as Count. Of course, I could not allow that to happen, so I banished him. But he returned to Barovia nearly twenty years ago. Rowan's eyes went wide. Yes, Strahd said. He tried to kill me again. This time I took his punishment more seriously. He is here beneath our very feet, locked in a tomb, never to get out. Though Rowan had never felt sympathy for her father before, her hands tightened into fists. She looked at the plate of salad before her, then up at Strahd, staring him in the eyes. And what about my mother? Sariel? She bewitched Metis. He became a drooling dog whenever they were together, unable to see the witch for what she was. But at least she had enough sense to try and stop him from rebelling against me. She knew it was a useless endeavour. Even her charms, however, could not dissuade his lust for power. So he killed her. Rowan glared at the Count. She could believe that her father had tried to take Strahd's throne. But she had a growing sense that her father might have wanted something more than blood and power. In her mind she could hear the fear in her father's voice, see the desperation in his eye, and that glimmer of hope. You're lying, Rowan said, feeling the heat of anger rising. What an accusation, Strahd said, looking pleased at her defiant tone. My mother was no witch, and if she had any influence over my father, it would only be for the better. If my father really cared for my mother, I don't believe he would have killed her. Why would you not believe it? What did your father tell you about your mother's death? Oh, that's right, he didn't. Rowan's heckles rose, and a low wolf's growl issued from her throat. It was a pity, Strahd said. Sariel was such a pretty thing. I heard her pleading for mercy before Metis ripped her neck open. That was enough. His callous manner and hateful words ignited a rage that Rowan had never unleashed before. She transformed into a wolf right there in front of everyone, toppling her chair and crashing dishes to the floor. Somewhere beyond the blood pulsing through her eardrums, she heard Henry yell at Navarra to cast a calming spell, and a second later she felt a soothing presence trying to wash over her, but she shrugged it off and lunged at the vampire. Another spell was cast, this time by Strahd, and Rowan slammed headlong into an invisible wall of force. It pushed her back from the table. Rowan gnashed her teeth and tried to break through the barrier, but it was futile. She stopped and crouched on all fours, seething and snarling. 
Trust me when I say this wall is for your protection, not mine, Strahd said. His hand was formed in an arcane gesture. Now, if you would kindly take a seat so we can have a civilized conversation, I might forgive your bad manners. Rowan's rage was still burning, but she knew if she persisted she would only put herself and her friends in danger. They stood no chance against the vampire in a fight. There was nothing she could do except endure his taunts. She transformed back into an elf, and Strahd dropped his spell, allowing her to sit back down. Navara knew she would be the next topic of conversation, even before the fifth course came out. When it came and she smelled fish, she braced herself for the worst. "'My sweet, lovely Navara," Strahd said. Navara fixed her eyes on the new plate, a classic Harrington dish of eels stewed in a sauce of onion, nutmeg, anchovy, and vodka served over asparagus. "'You are a breath of fresh air,' he said. "'I treasure the days we have spent together, "'and I know that our love will blossom all the more "'now that your frog has turned into a prince. "'I feel I have learned so much about you, "'and yet I long to learn so much more. "'What else should I know about my mistress "'that you have not already told me "'in the passion of a sweet embrace?' Navara gripped her fork, pushing the food around on her plate. She was about to tell him how she had planned to break up with Vasili, but realized it would be foolish and pointless. Navara doesn't love you. She loves Gostomir. Navara's eyes bulged as Henry blurted out the truth. She saw Rowan jab him in the ribs and was glad for it. Gostomir? Strahd mused. That's right, your patron. I remember you wanted to introduce me to him back in town. No matter. If he was too bashful to show himself to Vasili, I doubt he will give us any trouble from now on. Besides, you are not the kind of girl to play the harlot with another man. Are you, Navara? He looked at her expectantly. The whole situation was a hysterical nightmare. All Navara could think of was Gostomir's silly sentence of the day. A man without meaning is often mean without meaning to be mean. She looked at Strahd, then realized that the ridiculous adage might have more meaning now than it ever had before. The muscles in Strahd's jaw twitched. I understand you have an odd proclivity to utter nonsense whenever you do not know what to say. "'But I really do expect a straight answer.' "'Why?' Navara asked, at a loss. "'Why bother caring about me when you're clearly trying to woo someone else? "'And you have all of them!' she gestured at the consorts. "'Come now, Navara. Jealousy does not suit you. "'Why should a rose begrudge the other flowers their place in the bouquet? "'I can appreciate them all.' A crazed laugh escaped her lips, and she reached for a glass of Riesling. She downed it in one gulp. After setting the empty glass on the table, she coughed and patted her chest. Very well. I will not press the issue. I know you love me, Navara. We can leave it at that. The sixth course arrived. Roast peacock with apricots and rosemary gravy served over a saffron and chamomile risotto. The drink was a burgundy wine. "'My darling Irina,' Strahd said, turning his attention to the woman beside him. "'I have been more than generous giving you time to mourn the loss of your father and reflect on our engagement. I even gave you space, allowing you to run off to Velaki. But the time has come to set a date for our wedding.' Your friend Navara can testify that I am not the monster you think me to be, and your friend Henry will officiate the ceremony. So, Irina, when shall we be wed? When can I call you Countess von Zarevich? Irina looked to her friends. Her expression was doleful but indomitable. 
Then she turned to the vampire. Never. I will never marry you, Strahd. Not today, not tomorrow, not till the end of time. I would rather die a thousand deaths than become one of your playthings. And not a day goes by that I don't pray to the Morning Lord for your destruction. Strahd paused for a moment, looked down at the table. When he looked up, his eyes burned like embers. I love you, Irina, but sometimes I am astounded by your selfishness. Your soul's union with mine is the only thing that can break this valley's curse. All Barovia will suffer because you refuse my generosity. Oh, you will marry me. When everyone you ever cared for is dead or driven mad, when you have traversed the valley ten times over and still find no escape from my lust, when you have cried out to God for death and he does not answer for fear of my wrath, then you will love me. Then you will marry me. They sat in silence for the rest of the dinner. When the dessert of chocolate cake and creme brulee came out, Strahd finally spoke again. His tone changed back to sarcastic levity. Seeing as how the hour is late and the weather is dreadful, you may all stay the night. He beckoned for Gertrude to sit with him. Tomorrow morning my carriage will escort you anywhere you please in Barovia. I promise your passage will be safe. But once you set foot outside of my carriage, you must take care. Barovia may not be the friendly place you remember. Gertruda smiled as she sat on Strahd's lap. He caressed her face, his black-nailed fingers traveling up her cheek. Then he grabbed her hair, pulled her head back, and sank his fangs into her neck. Having had nothing to eat or drink the entire dinner, he satisfied himself by draining her dry. It all happened in a matter of seconds. When his mouth pulled free, he sighed and closed his eyes, while his grotesquely long tongue licked every drop of blood from his lips. Then he stood, opened his eyes, and dropped Gertruda's lifeless body to the floor like a piece of trash. Rahadin and the consorts stood up from their seats. Strahd walked past them all, stopping at the double doors. I have business to attend to, but feel free to explore my castle if you wish. You may go anywhere except the lower levels. He opened the door, then turned and looked over his shoulder. Irina, Navara, I hope you will stay. But if you decide to leave with Henry and Rowan tomorrow, just know that one day you will come back and call Ravenloft your home. Farewell. <laughs>